Welcome to the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast, where business leaders tell their stories and share their insights. All our guests have a personal connection with Nottingham Business School. So listen, learn, enjoy and share. Welcome to another episode of the Nottingham Business School's Business Leaders Podcast with me, Mike Sassy. Forensic accountants have played a pivotal role in exposing some of the most notorious financial frauds of recent years, from the Enron scandal in America to the collapse of British home stores on our own high street. The expertise of forensic accountants has led to the uncovering of frauds and the jailing of fraudsters. Catherine Wasterley is a director of the Forensic Investigations team at accountancy firm KPMG. She started her career as an auditor, but has spent the last decade in forensics, investigating accounts, identifying risk, and uncovering fraud. Fraud now accounts for 40% of all the crimes committed in Britain. So we're very grateful that Catherine has found time in her busy schedule to join us here at the Nottingham Business School for this episode of the Business Leaders Podcast. Catherine, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. So I vividly remember being mesmerised by two great films, The Smartest Guys in the Room, about the Enron Scandal, and The Wizard of Lies, about Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. So is forensic accounting always so exciting? <laughs> uh, well, it can be. Um, I mean, you look I look at those those specific examples and, and, the, and the other big ones that we've seen, and you just think, oh, my goodness, you know, how did somebody um, not see that? Or how did multiple people not see that? How did somebody not report it? Um, but I always uh, think, you know, the benefit of hindsight is, uh, is a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, fraud depends essentially at its core at getting people to suspend um, their belief. So, you know, when you're in the middle of these situations, you're just thinking, this is fantastic. You know, we're beating the market. We're do- you know, this company's doing so well. Um, what a fantastic leader uh, that person must be to be able to generate these returns. But is it great fun investigating that kind of thing, uncovering that kind of thing, is it? It is. It, it can be. It can be really interesting. I mean, it can also be in sort of uh, incredibly detail orientated, as you imagine. And uh, I mean, you know, some of these these really large ones will take years, years and years to kind of go through the detail of. But, uh, but no, there's always um, not necessarily a smoking gun, but there's always a few things you come across investigations and you just think, oh my goodness, that's a good one. I'll uh, uh, I'll write that down. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna ask you this. Uh, I, I, I hope I don't sound too trite when I said, do you always get your man? <laughs> it depends. I mean, I think when you've sort of got an internal um, fraud and someone's got a sort of reasonable suspicion and you come in, um, usually there's uh, there's something behind that. You know, people people think there's suspicion because there's other things that they've noticed and and uh, and you you know you dig in and you find a, sort of a lot more detail and then you know, something's going to happen and that person's going to sort of suddenly decide they want to resign or, uh, um, you know, there might be sort of gross misconduct hearings right. and things. Um, when it's external, it's a lot harder because um, obviously these, you know, the criminals aren't necessarily within reach um, depending on how they've sort of um, perpetrated the the fraud, if it's via sort of email or phone, things like that. Um, and they're very clever, unfortunately. And so, um, you know, they, they sort of got a, a, a game plan behind that. I guess it's online fraud that's particularly uh, yeah, prevalent that, at the moment? Yeah, that, that is in, incredibly rife. Everyone's lives are so much more online now. Um, and so, you know, they'll take any opportunity that they can um, to to sort of exploit um, a weakness. So um, to give you a few examples, we we see a lot um, where people will phone up businesses, they'll phone up the sort of purchase ledger and they'll pretend to be um, a supplier asking for payment or can I change the bank details? That's very common. Um, and uh, as soon as you sort of people are aware of that, you close that gap, you find that actually they're pretending to be a CEO. Um, oh, I really need this payment made. And they've done a bit of research. They know that the CEO is on a trip in Australia, can't can't be got hold of. So they're just sending this quick email. I need this payment made. You know, you have to do this and you have to do it now. Um, another one that we've seen um, recently a couple of times that's quite interesting was actually where they attack the CEO. So say you're owned by... Um, a, uh, a, a private equity house. Um, the CEO gets a WhatsApp, which, you know, WhatsApp is great in terms of being able to, no one can read your messages, but anyone can pretend to be anyone on WhatsApp as well. So you set it up saying, oh, I'm, um, this is a message from the owner of the, of the private equity house. Um, I need you, this is 
highly confidential. You may not tell anyone. I'm sending you over a non-disclosure agreement, you know, but I've been told you, you're the man for the job. I need you to do this, or lady. Uh, you know, and, and they play on that sort of sense of importance. And, and so, so effectively, they're being offered another another job, another role? They're, so they're, the idea is that uh, the private equity house is going to make an investment in another company. Right. So because the first company is owned by the private equity house, so we, you know, we need to borrow some funds. Um, but I need your help to do that because you are – the, you know, a really important person in this business. You are, you know, a great, uh, a, a great leader. So can you help me? Um, and unfortunately, these people sort of, you know, it's nice to have someone tell you that you're important and you're pivotal and you're crucial. But this and, is the, but this is a chief executive officer of a company, so it's not just some no. some lowly surf. It's no. not somebody who's who's never been <laughs> who you would have, you would have thought would have known better. You, you yeah, have. and I think that makes an, a, a a really important point actually that. Um, Anybody can be affected by fraud because the problem is that the people committing these crimes are incredibly intelligent. They're incredibly well resourced. They've got lots of time and they're quite happy to spend that time researching their target. Um, And so while you might think, oh, well, I would never be affected by that. That's just that doesn't play out. You know, we don't see it being only one certain type of person or one certain job. It's, you know, it's across the piece. Okay, Which must make your job all the more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. When we see these different things, you think, oh, that's an interesting angle. <laughs> I mean, I still think these people are terrible and completely lacking in empathy um, and, you know, have no interest in the damage. And morality. That they do. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, completely immoral. immoral. But um, uh, it's, yeah, it is, it is still, it's quite intriguing. Okay. So you obviously love what you do. <laughs> We're rattling through this here. <laughs> um, they, well, it occurs to me, you know, um, on a, on a very superficial level, the word forensic. Forensic is a job title, forensic count, and people say, oh, goodness gracious, you know, that that sounds really cool and exciting. But on another level, what you do must require a, a, a level of, of concentration, of, of detail, the like of which most people couldn't, 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 um, couldn't get their heads around. Um, I don't know. I think, I'm not sure that it's most people sort of wouldn't be able to do it. I think it's probably a mindset in terms of whether or not, you know, you're that kind of person. You know, you have to want to be into the detail. You have to want to ask lots of questions and sort of, you know, keep digging and digging. Um, I, I think of it sort of a bit like a jigsaw. So if you you come to a jigsaw and you think, oh, actually, that sounds great. That'd be really interesting. I'll, I'll do that. And then you realise that there's only actually a photo, uh, only a picture of the um, the bottom right corner. So that's all you've got for this, you know, couple of hundred piece jigsaw. Um, so like, okay, right. Then you realise that somebody's been tidying up and they put, a, you know, quite a lot of other jigsaw pieces in from other puzzles that are nothing to do with yours. Um you still got to then work out, you know, which ones relate to your jigsaw. How can you put that all together so that you can stand back and look at the whole picture? Um, and I think if you hear that analogy and think, oh, that sounds fun, then, you know, this is definitely something you could do. If it makes you you run away and hide and just think, oh, my God, why would anyone do that? Then, you know, that probably it's uh, it's maybe not, uh, not the job not for, for you. you. <laughs> okay, well, you are the director of the investigations team at KPMG. What particular... Um, leadership challenges does that pose for you? Um, I think the thing with investigations is that there's no tick list. You know, most investigations have at least some nuance that's different. Um, And so for each one, you've got to approach it thinking, right, well, how am I going to do this particular investigation? I haven't got a a tick list that says, if I do these 10 things in this order, I can write my report. Um, And so you've got to come up with a sort of a plan for each of those, like what's the specifics of the investigation? What's the needs of the client? You know, what are they looking for? Um, And, you know, we, along with sort of, you know, most professional services businesses, um, you know, we're hierarchical in that we bring people in in sort of years and you go through and you do your few exams and and you sort of automatically work your way up. Um, And then you get to a point where you start sort of get, you know, promoted. But essentially it's sort of... um, you're, you're building that knowledge every single year through as you go. Um, and so it's really important that teaching is a big part of what we do. But we've got to provide a really high standard and we've got to do it efficiently, 
balanced with then you know growing people's confidence and um and and teaching them um and i think so one of those challenges is really you know how do we how do we achieve that balance um and i think for me i think it's possible to have really high expectations of people and i think we should because that is the only way that you know people are going to really be able to develop um but also to have those high standards of care um and you know, the way that I kind of describe my approach is that um, I say, well, you know, I will help you get ready. I will set you up with what you need. And whether that's um, by sort of you seeing what I do, or whether it's, you know, sitting down, having a really detailed scoping conversation. um, And I will be there throughout for you. Um, But at the end of the day, I expect you to jump. I expect you to kind of, you know, throw yourself into it and sort of, you know, see what happens and what you can do. And how is that different? How is that different from, say, other um, uh, from managing, from leading other teams? Uh, from an investigation point of view, I think sometimes, you know, it's it, it's more about, you know, let's just, you know, here's a set way of working, and people can sort of work it through at their own speed. I think with investigations, you know, it's quite fast paced. We need people to sort of just go in there and say, right, I can lead this meeting. I'll, you know, I'll do that and I'll come out with what, what we need or I'll, pre- I'll do this presentation. Confidence is a big thing. Um, and But I think equally that's something that people can be supported to have. I think, you know, it's not necessarily some people I'm sure have it from innate quantities and that's great. But I think with other people, it's there. They just need... Um, need that sort of, you know, sometimes a bit of a push. Drawing out of them. Okay. So back to the beginning, um, I've heard you say that um, you took your first job in accountancy well, without fully realising what would be involved. <laughs> so is that, is that, is that still underpins of everything that you do, the accountancy <laughs> angle? Um, the, the, the doing things without proper research. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I think that was, uh, yes, that's certainly not a little anecdote that I'll be sharing with my children before they've actually sort of, you know, fully set themselves on their career path. Um, I mean, I think there is an element, though, that I, you know, I look back and I think, you know, yes, I probably should have done sort of more research. But actually, you know, how that research um is performed, I think, is quite important. So if you'd said to me before I sort of sat on the graduate scheme, so it's um, three more years of, of pretty hard exams. You have to, you know, do quite a lot of um, sort of external study and you've basically studied for the whole of your life up to this point. Um, and then you're going to be analysing business accounts. Um, you'd sort of, I'm not sure I would have gone, brilliant, that sounds great, yeah. Um, but again, if I'd done more research again and said, but, you know, you'll meet people who you, um, all the way through, who you'll still consider to be fantastic friends. Um, you get to go into a variety of businesses and, you know, look into their accounts, talk to people from across the whole business, you know, not just in finance, um, and see if you can work out if anything's gone wrong. Um, then I think I would have thought, yeah, no, this is the right choice. Um, we just don't mention the New Year's Day stock takes to the new people. And then that's <laughs> but, but it's interesting because I've, I've interviewed a, on this pod, I've interviewed a couple of, 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 of high powered individuals who are essentially accountants, but prefer not to be called accountants. Yet, yet conversely, you, you, you're you quite happy to hang on to the, uh, hang on to the tag because you, you love it. <laughs> Well, I do. I don't. I don't mind being an accountant. Um, I mean, I think you're right. I think if I when I introduce myself as a forensic accountant, then uh, I definitely get more traction maybe than, uh, <laughs> yes, I than, than, why, than yes. if I just. But then I think it's interesting because actually, if you look at um, you know a number of the sort of CEOs or other business leaders we've got, a lot of them have come through the accountancy route. Um, and actually, you sort of get to a certain point and you think, well, I can pivot these skills to you know something different that's maybe more strategic or more operational. Um, and so I think it does, you know, it comes with a lot of, a lot of um, sort of good skill set that, that I think is used. And do you think, do you think the, the, the background in accountancy um, underpins whatever you should choose to do to take, take your, whatever you choose to do, not so much do next, but wherever, however you choose to develop your career? I do, I do. I think it's, um, it's a really good sort of training ground. And actually, um, quite a lot of the people that we have coming into forensic have gone through the audit route, which is where I started as well. Um, And it comes back to that point about businesses. You know, if you're actually interested in running a business, what better way than to be going out to, you know, 20 plus businesses in a year and understanding what, you know, how they work. Yes, you've got to understand the numbers, but I'd say any business probably needs to understand the numbers, but you have to understand, you know, how their logistics work for stock. You need to understand how their sales processes work, that kind of thing. Um, so I do think it's a, it's a it's a great starting point. Yeah. 
Yes, I, you, you make you make a good point there. I can I can I can see exactly what you mean. There's something else that, that you wrote that I read, which 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 was a great line. Um, it was that um, your nosiness made you a good forensic accountant. Now, can I tell you that when I was an editor, I only took on nosy stuff, so I know exactly where you're coming from there. Um, do you think all successful leaders, people who are successful in business, are to a greater or lesser extent nosy? I think so. I think. I mean, I think. You know, I'm quite happy to be uh, to be to be someone that's uh, considered to be nosy. But I think you know you could you can turn the phrase around, can't you? And, and and have it be sort of you know an interest outside of just your own small world. Um, and I think that's got to be crucial, hasn't it? You know, if you're very focused, and there are times when you know laser focus is really important. But for a lot of the time, and I think for leaders, you have to be able to sort of see what's out there, what's that wider piece, what what else is all that interesting thing coming you know down the line there. Um, and uh, you know, all oh, that's interesting happening over there. Those people are talking about. You know, what do I, you know, should I factor that into what I'm doing? Um, I mean, I think there's probably a balance. Um, you know, I've also come across leaders who have a, a bit of sort of uh, magpie tendencies. So it's sort of like, oh, shiny. Uh, and they focus oh, very much yes, over there. We've all been there and then, yes. you know, five minutes later, oh, shiny over here. Uh, so, you know, there's definitely a balance. But I, I, I genuinely think that that wider interest, you know, is, is so important. You've got to be able to see the wood, not just the individual trees. Okay. So given that you enjoy your accountancy, given that you love your forensic accountancy, why did you fairly recently choose to take on a much greater leadership role, a directorship? And what, what was it that made you want to, to be in charge? Um, I think I think it seems like a natural step. Um, I mean, I've talked about sort of professional services kind of having that moving up piece. And so you kind of, it's quite good because you can see, you know, the potential that's there and what it looks like. And it is so important to have really good role models. I think, I think it's very hard to, you know, to be what you can't see. Um, and actually, in our business at the moment, there's, you know, fantastic role models. Um, and so it felt like, you know, that was going to be the next step. I really, really enjoy what I do. I really enjoy getting into the detail. But actually you know, you take the next step and that gives you more freedom to, you know, maybe think about sort of extra things that you could do. What could you add in rather than sort of waiting for someone to say, oh, well, you know, Kat could help with this. Um, and I think it's, you know, you get to own the conversation. And I, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to sort of say, you know. Own I'm the conversation. The, yeah. That one. Um, so I think, you know, the next level down, there's always someone above you. So we talk about um, engagement leaders. That would be the person that sort of owns the engagement. Um, and so being a director enables me to do that. And so I have the primary relationship with the client. So I can sort of say, well, this is what I think you need. You know, you tell me what you need. Um, and so I have fantastic people that support me and say, well, I've got this information that you might want to factor in and so on. But, you know, the buck stops with me. And I feel like that gives you an ownership. Um, so it's an obvious leadership progression. Yes. Yeah, I feel so. So, plus you get invited to do things like this. So, I mean, why would you know? <laughs> why would you not do it? Don't tell me you leadership. <laughs> so, is it? Is there? A, I, I, I accept what you're saying, but is there a? Is there a thing about getting to a certain level and then wanting to give something back to want to sort of spread your wings and take what you have learned and and, and give it to other people? Yes, and, and and I think that's crucial. I think that, that comes from you know what I was saying before about um, supporting people. You know, I could just do the work, but you know, that's one thing, but actually that doesn't achieve what I need, which is a really strong foundation of people beneath me that I can then go forward from. So that's the, you know, that's almost, I guess, the the selfish point of, you know, why I want to bring people forward. But actually I get a lot of um, a sense of achievement and enjoyment from seeing people grow and their confidence and their abilities and being able to say, right, well, yeah, you take this on, just, you know, let me know what I need to do. I think that's important to me, absolutely. Okay, at the, at the front end of what you just said there, do you think all good leaders build a build a team that underpins their leadership? I think you have to. I I think it's crazy because you can't do everything yourself. Um, I think one of these things about you know that step up. I wanted to do it, and it's great, but it, there is something that says, "Well, that's taking me away from kind of like the day to day detail." I need to know that I've got the right people doing that for me. But does does that mean that you know you must have been preparing this? You know, you know, are you are you a leader where you know twelve months ago you thought, right, this is I'm going to go for this, I'm going to, I'm going to become a director, but I need to start to doing the groundwork, preparing the team underneath. Is that is that is that what leaders do? Um, I mean, I th would hope that the best leaders do it subconsciously, so they're not sort of you know it's actually just inbuilt into them to bring people up with them. 
Um, you know, and so I know in my team, I've got some fantastic people and I can see, you know, that actually they will come up and, you know, they might be next to me as fellow directors or it might be sort of, you know, having that support depending on where they are in their career. And, you know, and then, I mean, obviously, ideally, everyone is going to move up. Um, but I think it's just something that you should do because it's the, the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do because actually it helps you as well. But just as a general um, as a general sort of uh, concept, I think, you know, wanting people to do well, that empathy that the criminals don't have um, is is really important. And so I think it's just, you know, it's one of the things you have to have as a as a business leader so and any leader. Looking back on your journey so far up the leadership ladder, what uh, what would you pinpoint as, as your successes? Um, I don't think it's very much linked to that, actually. I think um, it's where I've built up people's confidence and I've seen them grow from that. So, you know, we've had sort of maybe specific conversations or I've pushed them to take on certain roles and things like that. And then after that, you can sort of see there's almost like a a, a step change and they sort of click. So, oh, yeah, I can do this. I've done it before, so it must be OK. I can do it again. Um, and, you know, that's enabled me to do well, but also it's just given me a great sense of achievement. Um, and I think conversely, where it hasn't worked so well is potentially where I haven't had necessarily the confidence in my own abilities, despite evidence to the contrary, which, given that's actually my job, is to find the evidence, you know, but it's it's quite hard. It's <laughs> Right, I understand. OK. So, uh, as you know, this is a podcast for the um, Nottingham Business School, uh, where there are many, many, many leaders. Um, as a fellow leader, what uh, what one single piece of crucial key advice might you give them? Um, I think it's all about that sort of empathy, because I think that then encompasses a number of things. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen leaders who've made people cry, not because they have been shouting at them in a meeting, mm. just because they haven't paid attention to the impact of what they're doing and their sort of single-minded focus on you know the job in hand has done to the the team and so you know within that empathy you can have um the sort of appreciating when something's not working but also you know what you need to do to make it work really well so that building up of the confidence and things um i think i think that leadership skill is probably the most important and then you cascade your other ones off that don't you everything falls from that okay Catherine Westerly thank you very very much for joining us here on the Business Leaders Podcast thank you if you enjoyed this episode then why not check out some of the others that are also available including those with the chair of the FA Debbie Hewitt broadcaster and entrepreneur David Lloyd and the Vice Chancellor of Nottingham Trent University, Professor Edward Pegg. The Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast is produced for Nottingham Trent University by Celtic Tiger Productions. Your presenter was Mike Sassy and your producer was John Collins. <laughs>